is the way it's justified. And the way it's justified is rigorous use of empiricism, the testing of the theories, the searching for relevant evidence, the support that the, the, the support that that evidence applies to that conclusion, the subjective emotional processes that human beings go through when they when they gather the evidence and draw the conclusions and so on. That that's that's irrelevant to science. It's the matter of objective logic that is the scientific part of it. The, the other human part of it, you, don't worry about that. Forget all about that. Get rid of it. Now we'll see that this becomes important later in, in, in other lectures to, to follow because there are other schools of thought that argue that what the scientist actually does is extremely important. Not, and that the justification that comes when a paper is written is less important. So it's a diametric opposition between the logical positivists and the sociologists, the strong school, the weak school that we'll be talking about um, later on. Where disputes arise, where there's controversy, the positivists um, were clear that, there, that these disputes could be resolved in perfectly objective ways simply by comparing the theories directly with the facts. Just tell me the facts. What is the empirical evidence? And we can quite clearly and obviously then resolve whatever, uh, whatever difficulties um, that we had. Now, as I say, this school of thought epitomised for decades the scientific, the scientific method. However, it ran into problems. Uh, it ran into problems when subjected to a barrage of criticism from a number of quarters, most importantly from Karl Popper. But I'll come on to Karl Popper in just a minute. Before going, the very foundation of logical positivism was in fact undermined by an English philosopher named Hume back in the early 18th century. In the early 18th century, over a hundred years before the logical positivists came along, Hume pointed out the problem with induction. Famous examples. Will the sun rise in the sky tomorrow? Yes. Why will it? Because the sun has risen every single morning for millions of years. Hume's argument is that this in itself is insufficient reason for it to be true that the sun will rise tomorrow. Just because it's risen every day for millions of years in the past doesn't mean it will continue to do so in the future. We might think it probable that it will, but we can't be certain that it will, and it is not true, not true that it will. Whenever we make inductive inferences, according to Hume, we presuppose the uniformity of nature. Uh, now that's often referred to as universalism. And that term universalism we'll be returning to a bit later on. When we induce from the sun has always risen to the sun will rise, what we're doing is we're moving from a data set about which we have observations to something quite different. When we induce that all bodies observed so far obey Newton's law of gravity to all bodies obey Newton's law of gravity, we are assuming that nature is uniform and that the laws that govern gravity, 
bodies within gravity and the sun rising, etc., etc., is universal and unwavering. Now, what reason do we have to believe in the uniformity of nature? Well, because nature has always been uniform to date. Because all our observational data to date supports a uniform universe. That, even if that was true, which it isn't, but I'll come back to that, even assuming that universalism has applied everywhere at all times, doesn't mean that it will continue to do so in a data set that's not yet observed. Take another, the, perhaps the most famous example, the, the case of the swans, the bird, the swan. For thousands and thousands and thousands of years, so far as Hume and Aristotle and all of the other Europeans were concerned, swans were white. And Europeans justifiably moved from the statement, all observed swans are white, to the statement, all swans are white. That movement from all observed swans to all swans, of course, came unstuck when Europeans arrived in Australia and found black swans. The same might be said uh, of Newton's law of gravity. For hundreds of years, we saw that all observed bodies obey Newton's law of gravity until we come to the middle of the 20th century and quantum mechanics gave us illustrations of bodies that do not obey Newton's law uh, of gravity or Newtonian uh, mechanics. Quantum me Newton's mechanics worked Newton's mechanics explained with enormous accuracy and all observed phenomena, you know, movement of bodies through space and, 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 and what have you. But the movement from all observed bodies obey Newtonian mechanics to all bodies obey Newtonian mechanics was demonstrated not to be so. Mechanics 